and reading websites such as Centre for Cities and so on. The, the cohesion policy reforms in, in the European Union, cohesion policy is the largest single pro program of the European Union. It's about 0.34% of European GDP. It's about 45 billion a year in terms of euros. I think the allocation for the UK in the programming period, the, next, the current one's 11 billion euros over seven years. Um, and of course, it's, it's, it's primarily oriented to the weaker regions and the weaker countries. Um, but all countries are involved in cohesion policy because, of course, you know, there's, there's big challenges in some of our regions and cities in the UK or in Germany, uh, which are very real. It's not just a matter of Poland or, or Italy or whatever. So all countries are involved in different ways. One of the issues is that any form of development action, whatever it is, and this comes from the international development literature, is the whole lesson about conditionalities. From the international development literature, one of the problems that developed over 20 or 30 years, so many people observing this, is that as you give money, of course, you start setting up a codependency relationship between the donors and the recipients. And the recipients need the donors to give the money, but the donors need recipients, a market, in order for the donor. And you end up with a rental capture problem on both sides of the economy. And then it's very difficult to identify whether it's working in some sense or not, because the question is, what are the incentives, what's the behavior, all the stuff about principal agent problems and so on, monitoring. And one of the lessons that's come out of all the work of people like the World Bank in particular is the, is the issue of conditionality, is, is you need some sort of legal restrictions where the architect of the policy makes it extremely explicit what the intentions have to be and certain conditions that you have to meet. And the conditions have to be agreed on both sides. Otherwise, money is being given without any clear monitoring out any clear rules or rubrics and so on. So conditionality is a big issue, and this became very central in the European case, um, how to develop this line of thinking. So a lot of the work on the conditionalities programs in terms of reforming cohesion policy where there's a real... There were always kind of implicit, implicit conditionalities in different cases, but to make it absolutely black and white those rules and very, very clear. So there's a lot, a lot of people involved in this. And these different elements of the reform, I have to say, involved hundreds of academics, including some of the very top people in Britain, people like Tony Atkinson at Oxford, Andres Rodriguez Pose, LSE. This is top, top level, and it's not just UK. People from all over the world, from the OECD, the United Nations, and the World Bank, great scholars, have been involved on in many, many different levels because they're all different components of how to develop development policy at the regional and the urban level where you're trying to do the right thing and you're trying to develop an architecture and a system to make sure that things are done in the best manner possible. So one is the role of conditionalities. Smart specialisation is something I'll explain a little bit about. It. It's about the prioritisation problem. This is Stiglitz and Fatusi. When you've got constrained budgets and particularly in the difficult environment that we're in, you have to make priorities and you have to concentrate and how you do that is a very thorny problem. And that's what smart specialisation is about. It's not about specialisation. And some of the stuff I read in the UK has kind of gone off at a tangent. I, I'm not meaning government stuff. I'm just meaning stuff in general I've read about. It. I'm kind of, that's not what it is about. The other thing is the results orientation. If any of you are familiar, this is a Danny Roderick argument. And that's very central to the reforms, is the results orientation. In order to develop this, the idea is also to develop programs and policies which are much more, in some sense, integrated. Policies of any form, in any country, or in any international arena, can be undermined by a sec by a an overly sectoral silo mentality. And the Americans are very explicit on this. You know, if you don't have the transport people working hand in glove with the land use people, then you're only ever going to get a partial type of intervention, partial outcomes. And that's a general kind of problem. We know that across many dimensions. So it's to try to facilitate much more multidimensional. So if you've got innovation or R&D related activities, you also need to get the skills activities mapped onto that. Otherwise, they're working in different arenas. They, they may be parallel to each other, but there's no connections. So they have what's called the Common Strategic Framework, because they're changing the legal architecture, so you can use funding from different sources. So you could integrate skills policies with technology policies and have a more integrated approach, whereas the, the, the system as it was didn't really lend itself to that kind of thing. So we're doing a transport policy, or we're doing a, a social development policy. Often they didn't map onto each other, because the policy arena was set in these different silos, and that's what this Common Strategic Framework is about. Another element which is very important is what's called the European Code of Conduct and Partnership, and the whole thing about partnership agreements. The idea of partnership agreements is basically a multi-level governance argument. Any kind, of, any kind of development policy at the urban and regional level here has to involve lots of different actors because they play different roles. If you want to get the maximum out of that policy, you want to try to get all the right actors working together, whether it's university, skills, training people, whatever. You want to try and develop systems. You want big companies working with SMEs. You want supply chain initiatives working with people who are exporters. 
it's basically trying to get all the different elements working together, and that means in some sense some things will be at the top level of government, that's the kind of overall strategic direction will come from central government, but there'll be many things at a regional and local level where local and regional actions are much better placed for intervening, designing, monitoring and so on. So the common strategic framework and the, and the, the kind of par partnership concept, the partnership agreement, is about that. And again, this comes from you know, lessons of all over the world of development programs, where things, <coughs> are, where things have worked where they haven't, what kind of things have seemed to have done better in certain cases, where things haven't. And this is the idea of having some sort of more integrated approach. Whether it works out like that, we'll see, but we're not going to find out for five to ten years, because development activities take a long time to understand the longer and effects of them, but basically that's the orientation. And the kind of place-based approach, uh, a central element here is a greater urban emphasis. Now, the urban emphasis, I'll talk about it in a second. Um, I think some of the things I'm, I'm, I'm referring to here are things that, to some extent, we do already in the UK. I mean, so a lot of the material that's been used in, certain, in terms of uh, developing the ideas at the European level is quite a lot, which is, is out of the UK. You know, a lot of stuff is very, very good. Some things are very advanced. It, it depends. It's a patchy picture, as in all countries. But there's lots of things that we do here, particularly on the, the monitoring uh, results orientation, where I'd say the UK is one of the countries at the forefront of the, um, um, of the agenda. Um, and then there's also a shift away from uh, grant funding, to a greater reliance on uh, loans, modern financial instruments, European investment bank type activities. The idea to try and develop much better portfolio effects across different activities where you've got funds being recycled into different activities. So there's a lot more of an emphasis on that as well. And another aspect of that which is important is it's also about capacity building. Institutions, including public sector institutions, at the local and regional level need to learn how to use these instruments. Because actually you can do a lot with them that you wouldn't be able to do with normal grant financing. And of course, given the constraints at the moment, a lot of straight grant aid is, is not really the agenda anymore. So, I mean, the place-based approach, some of you will know about these discussions within economic geography, regional economics, and so on. Is, is, the basic assumption is that place really matters. It's not a backdrop. It's not wallpaper. And, you know, London's not just a big Manchester. Manchester's not just a big Cardiff. And Amsterdam is the same size in population approximately as Copenhagen, but they're quite different places. And so simply mapping one thing onto another, there's some things you can do, but there's other things you can't do. You have to try and think much more about the context. And the, one, of the, one of the issues which is central here is the whole kind of institutional structure, governance systems and so on, which differ enormously. And of course, in the European context, the heterogeneity is amazing in terms of these issues. And, and again, there's a big debate about this. People, some people talk about people-based people -based policies versus place-based policies, whereas someone like myself, I regard that as a kind of largely meaningless dichotomy. I mean, you know, internet advertising, deregulatory things regarding the IT is, is of course, space-blind. A lot of uh, competition policy issues will be basically space-blind. Um, but then if you think in R&D policy for, let's say, aerospace technology, well, of course, there's only four or five places in the UK which are going to benefit from that, and there's only probably 10 or 12 places across Europe, and actually you can list them. Of course, it's not space-blind. It's place-based in the sense that so many activities in terms of the way our economy functions are explicitly spatial. I mean, the fact that we've got London tells you that. I mean, the economics of how businesses interact, face-to-face -face contact, spatial transactions, cost, commuting, supply chains, everything, geography is part of that story. And the way these dynamics play out is, in, is different in different places. So a simple, no, we're people-based we're, we're people policy versus place-based policy. I'm sorry, I, I don't buy that in most cases. And actually, most of it goes back to a misreading of a paper that was published in 1966 by Winnick. It's not a very good paper, but it sets a nice little argument out, and it's basically an updated version of that. So basically, you think about the interrelationships between companies, businesses, institutions, supply chains, all of that stuff, that you know, economic geography really matters. And the important thing about the World Development Report, it was the first international document that actually really said that, that people kind of took notice of. Um, and those interrelationships are different in different places. You know, the OECD talked about the granularity of growth, that so much of the macro issue actually is a function of all these different micro elements. And we think in terms of classification schemes like firms or sectors, but actually regions and cities are central classification schemes. In the past, we didn't talk so much like that, largely because the data was rubbish. 
we didn't have the data on these things. Whereas now that's not the case. The data on cities and regions is amazing, and the GIS revolution has transformed our understanding of these things. So you can think in terms of classification schemes, obviously firm, individual, institution, sector, and so on. But cities and regions also are very, you know, essential elements here, and they provide perspectives that you can't do via the other. So obviously it's it's another element in our kind of portfolio of analytical approaches. But in the end, how things, or how people, how regions, how localities, how institutions are going to respond to any kind of development programs, development incentives, depends on the behavior, depends how they respond to incentives, depends how the incentives are structured, depends on the quantity, the budgets, what the intention, the policy, and so on. And there's lots of stuff here which is, I wouldn't describe it as central to economics. It's become much more central in economics, but it's really from political science and sociology. It's all the social capital type arguments. The political scientists think inherently like this, whereas economists traditionally think it was kind of in the residual term. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think today people understand the kind of role of engagements, institutional things that actually do matter. And they vary enormously between countries, and they also vary enormously within countries. And so, you know, today, this is, I mean, a lot of this thinking was very much prior to the crisis, but actually, you know, growth and development challenges are more complex than we used to understand them. I mean, a t typical kind of macro approach comes out of growth accounting. Well, it, it helps you to estimate what you don't know. The problem is what you don't know is all the story, mostly. And, you know, that's the shift in thinking, but that's across all the inter international institutions. I mean, and you've got the Europe 2020 strategy, the OECD growth strategy, the Commission on Growth and Development, the US growth strategy. I mean, basically, three simple dimensions. It's, it's, a, it's a kind of a simple way of thinking about it, but the European one is smart, sustainable, inclusive. The OECD is strong, greener, cleaner, and fairer. It's the same dimensions. The US is innovation, sustainable, and something else. Basically, three dimensions. The point is you can have smart, clever growth where you've got all your PhDs making lots of technology things. That's all good. But in the end, if the benefits and the rents of it only accrue to a small scale of the population, it's not going to be sustainable in the social sense. If you've got tremendous growth in certain localities, but in the end it has deleterious effects on the environment, there's going to be some point at which you're, re you're reaching constraints that may be environmental resource constraints, but also institutional governance constraints. So the point is that we know that GDP and GDP growth is the central element. It's the most important. I mean, Krugman says it's not everything, but it's almost everything. But at the same time, these other things, there's been much, more, much greater awareness that these other things also map into this story. And it's also largely a data issue. I mean, a lot of these things we simply didn't have data on before that we do now. So you have a much broader understanding of growth. And then in terms of institutional governance, all that kind of stuff, which I guess when I was a graduate student, I thought was all the kind of soft stuff that I wasn't really interested in. Well, if it's good enough for people like Amartya Sen to spend most of his career working on, then it's fine for most of us. Capabilities, capacity at the institutional level, private, public, civil society, I think if you read people, you know, Asim Oglu, Robinson, my favourite of all is Danny Roderick, Sen, Tabellini, you know, they don't regard this stuff as minor or additional, they regard it as absolutely no, you know, really the key elements in the story. And it's part of my view is why the Netherlands is such a, a successful country, is the institutional governance, the way they work as teams, everything is about planning. When I tell people we don't have a spatial plan in England, they, my students just, uh, you know, their jaws are on the floor. <laughs> they, the Dutch plan everything, and they measure everything before they've done it. All the time, everything is about planning, medium and long term. They have institutions, bureaus, for planning. It's not socialist. They use very, very modern economic and econometric techniques. It's just a cultural difference about how they organise and work. So the place-based place approach is basically saying that places are different and there are different roles for different types of actors and different <coughs> institutions. And they're very much part of the story in terms of enhancing development. And you know, we know economic geography in implies inequalities. That's not a discussion. I've often heard people saying, oh, yes, but uh, you don't understand that you have inequalities across space. I'm sorry, I've published trucks loads on this stuff. Yes, you do. Geography tells you you have inequalities. With no geography, you can have an equilibrium where all the wages are the same. Once you've got geography, the fundamental tenet of geography is you cannot have a special price equilibrium in terms of rates of return on capital with equal wages and equal profits and equal housing prices. It's not possible. What you get is the differences. It's not the fact that you have differences. We know that from geography. That's why cities and regions are so interesting and they're so important to understand you have differences. It's not the fact that you have differences, it's the scale of the differences and how those differences change and evolve. Those are the difficult issues. 
And many of the issues, the place-based approach is very much that many of the clues of how to promote development are really at the local and the regional level. They're not all in the central government level. Central government has an extremely important role in terms of the horizontal frameworks, the overall big picture. Of course we know that. But many of the things at the local and regional level really are local and regional. I mean, you get a lot of development traps at a local level. And you know, if you, sat, if you sit down and start thinking about it, it's not difficult to identify these things. And they're different in different places again. So part of the argument is how do you develop programs and policies if you're going to have programs and policies? Of course, that's a separate discussion. I've written a book on this, but that's a separate discussion. If you're going to have a program and policy, how is the best way that you want to try and organize it? And here, I, I, one of the arguments, one of the emphases that the, the shift in European thinking is really trying to transfer as much of the onus and the responsibility onto the local and regional people. Because local and regional people tend to say, we know our localities better than the central government does. Fine. There's your opportunity. The strange thing is, when you say that to localities, sometimes you say, well, okay, what do you want us to do? No, 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 no. No, no, no. It's the other way around. If you can make that statement, we actually know our people, we know our place, we know the issues, we know the bottlenecks, the missing links, fine. You want to develop a system that allows them to build a life, to develop that. Why is that important? Because actually the private sector will start to believe in it. If it's too top-down, private sector actors won't get involved in most cases because they know in the end it's going to be something which is too far distant from their own issues and realities. Trying to provide a system that allows localities, regions, countries within their own context to sort out the best solutions for them, that's the kind of the logic. It's not top-down, it's the opposite. It's trying to have top-down where you need it, but in order to mobilize the bottom up and the kind of MISO level. That's the idea. And that's not a European invention. I mean, this is very much where the literature is in terms of economic geography, policy, development, and so on. You know, this, this is basically where it is. And, but that's also impo important because if you think about, I mean, sometimes when I read the, when I read the popular press or you, see, you read things on television, you get an urban story. It's, it's all a good news story. It's all the cities and agglomeration. Bigger cities are more productive, spiky world. They're growing. Well, that's not true. Just a, a moment's thought tells you it can't be true. If higher cities with higher productivity, a spiky world with productivity levels in space, if they also have higher growth, well, as Robert Solo said in 1992, the whole world lives in one city. It's basically explosive. It can't be true. So it's important to think about what do we mean by that. We have productivity levels. Some places have higher productivity levels than others, and that's a natural outcome of geography. Differential growth rates are a function of many things, of which productivity levels will be one of those components. But that could go either way. You can have lower growth because of higher productivity levels, because it's more expensive. Other places will be catching up. That's the convergence argument. Or you could have a divergence argument where higher productivity has some sort of endogenous effect which generates further growth. So you get a divergence process. They're all possibilities. And the models we have out there actually allow for all of those different possibilities. The point is it's just different in different countries. And if you look at Europe, there isn't a general trend towards inequality across European regions. I've heard people say this type of stuff before. Prior to the crisis, that's not true. The question is which country are you talking about? There are groups of countries moving in different directions with different experiences internally. There's also groups of regions that also go across borders which are moving in different, different directions. We call this kind of club, uh, convergence clubs and so on. So the benefits of urban concentration, density, they're neither linear nor they're infinite across OECD countries and across Europe. It depends on the context. And these contexts are also shaped by political economy over many, many years. Decisions about transport investment, decisions about environmental issues, ho uh, changes in housing regulations, tax issues. I mean, they all play a, a part here. So you can't simply map from one country to another. And again, that provides the logic for a kind of a much more of a bottom-up uh, process. And really, the, it's the OECD who've done far more work on this than anybody else. I mean, just the difference between the OECD work and everyone else, I think, is enormous. Simply the quantity of material they've produced and the fact that they simply have better data than everyone else, which allows you to compare across countries. And the OECD work, I think, is the most important. So you've got differences across Europe. So you have to, if you've got a policy context, you know, which is trying to develop programs and policies in Europe, you've got to allow for the fact that in countries such as the UK, France, Netherlands, Spain, you know, you've got um, 
you know, if you take Spain, UK, France, for example, the dominant city, the, the primal city, London, Madrid, and so on, has a, has a huge role in terms of the functioning of the economy and the spatial structure of the economy. We know that. Whereas in the Netherlands, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. In northern Italy, Germany doesn't look like that. They're quite different contexts. And equally, the performance of cities and the way the urban and regional system is evolving is different. I mean, in the UK, for example, France, Netherlands, the population of the metropolitan regions, over a quarter of a million, has actually been growing slower than the national population growth. I mean, net migration in many parts of the UK is actually out of cities into smaller towns and rural areas, whereas in Spain it's into the big cities up to the crisis and now it's gone into reverse. It depends on the country. You know, the, these, these trends are different in different countries. In the Netherlands, it's, it's about getting out of cities into suburban areas. Innovation and entrepreneurship rates are much higher in the Netherlands in small towns and, and suburbs than they are in centre city. But if you understand the Dutch culture, then you understand why. Again, you can't simply map one on the other. And if you look at the big city story, quarter of a million upwards, the, the share of outputs of the big cities in the EU15 actually only increased by 0.6% in the decade prior to the crisis. In other words, nothing happened. Big cities weren't the story in Western Europe. And again, if you look at the OECD data, you see that this is actually a worldwide trend. A lot of the growth dynamics are smaller and medium centres or places which are connected with big cities. So it's a much more interesting and, and diverse pattern that sometimes you pick up in the press. Um, you know, the Netherlands is the quintessential polycentric type of context. But post-crisis, things changed again. I mean, the, the shock effects were very real. The places which have, in the European case, which have done the best are rural areas close to cities and intermediate regions, small towns, rural. The places which have struggled the most post-crisis across Europe are cities and remote rural re regions. Um, and it's a different story to the United States. A lot of our literature tends to look at the US case, and you read some of the famous people writing from the US. The US just looks completely different. When you look at the dynamics prior to the crisis, but also what's happened post the crisis, the US experience and the European experience is very different, and the US experience is very different to the UK experience as well. So, you know, there are, there are issues. So, the, I mean... There are some sense where the large city stories, cities are vulnerable, and there are other sense in which cities are really the key to the solution in some sense. But I'll, I'll come back to this at the end. I'm going to jump ahead. The smart specialization story is simply the problem of how do you prioritize? Because one of the problems from development policy worldwide that we know is that once you have too much of a political logic, every political actor wants to be able to has to go back to the constituency to say, we got something. We got some funding, we got some rents, whatever. And of course, a political logic automatically underline, undermines the principle of concentration and prioritization. And this has been a problem that cohesion policy has faced, but it's actually a problem that all development policies face. And if the priority is to concentrate, to prioritize and concentrate resources, You've got to make it explicit the basis on which you're doing it. And that's the stiglitz senfatusi report. And smart specialization came out of a way of thinking which was to do with people working on the economics of technology. And these, you know, these are world-famous people, Bart Van Hart, Paul David, Jacques Marest, Dominic Faure, so on. I mean, they're Bronwyn Hall. And they came up with this way of thinking. It was basically, for many places, they didn't start off thinking about cities and regions. They were thinking about sectors, technology spaces, and so on. But they realized increasingly it was a regional argument, uh, a city argument. <coughs> their observation was this. The best way for places to develop, if you've got limited resources and you've got to prioritize, try and focus on two things, the link between entrepreneurship and innovation, because that's the best long-run driver of growth, is trying to enhance that. And I think in the UK, there's lots of work going on in that space. The second thing they said is focus on the priority areas where you're linking innovation and entrepreneurship to the areas that the region already has potential scale in. Don't all try and be a nanotechnology centre. You don't have the people, you don't have the institutions, you don't have the depth and the supply chains. Whereas you can diversify around industries you've got, upgrade traditional industries. This was a very different message to the 1990s where everyone wanted to be the new high-tech silicon cluster or whatever. Their observation, and they come from that world, is don't do that. Diversify around what you've got. That's the best chance you've got. And that's really what smart specialization is about. So it's about diversification around a core set of specializations. It's don't become more specialized. It's completely the opposite. But diversification is not a random process from the point of view of policymakers. If it's random, you, will, you, would, know how, you would be able to bet on it in advance. You, if, you could, if, you, if you could bet on it in advance, then you'd do it. But we don't know that. 
So the best thing you can do is basically try and promote diversification around what you're good at. And in a sense, you know, what you're trying to also do is find systems of, to, to diversify knowledge, to spread knowledge. I mean, often knowledge transfers between countries much easier than it does between people within the same city. A lot of the knowledge spillover stuff we talk about, I don't even know what some of the people on the corridor with me are doing. You know, and I think that's a normal function. People in the same corridor in the same company often have no idea what each other's doing. We often say knowledge travels easier down corridors. Well, I'm not sure that's always the case. And so how do you disseminate knowledge in the local economy? That's very much um, one of the central issues. And there's a big kind of agenda on trying to promote experimentation, what Roderick calls self-discovery. And again, I think the UK has already been moving in this direction for a while. Um, but the important thing is the need for indicators. Any policy you intervene, you have to start having some sort of results indicators or outcome indicators. Um, otherwise, how do you know whether the policy is doing well or not? How do you know if it's going in the direction you intended? And this is a very important thing. You've got to make the intentions of a policy clear. And this is not a UK phenomenon. A general problem is uh, policies are largely driven by the logic of the financial allocations. The money is allocated, so we need to spend it because we've got money for this, so we spend it. And, of course, you need excellent accounting and accountability in terms of the allocation. That's correct. That's, but from the point of view of an economic argument, that's not accountability. That's accounting to make sure the money's spent. The accountability is what were you trying to do in the first place? What, was the intended, what were the intended objectives of the policy that you're designing? So you have to start at the other end, which is what is it you're trying to achieve and then work backwards from there. And that's where all these things about partnerships start to become extremely important. Because in order to achieve certain outcomes, you need to get all the right team together. You need to get the syndicates or the, you know, the different institutions together, whatever it is. And so the logic of the policy will also determine the potential roles and activities of the different partners. But that has to be made explicit. And this is part of the problem of evaluation. When you backtrack and you evaluate a lot of things, one argument is an its econometric argument. Was it, was it done well or not? That's one set of issues. But a more fundamental issue in many cases, it's, it's very hard to identify what were the intentions of the policy in the first place. And that's a much more fundamental issue, and this is a Danny Roderick argument. You need results indicators on every element of your policy, not because you know the results in, our, in, in, in advance. You need indica outcome indicators precisely because you don't know the outcomes. That's why you need them, in order to steer the policy and to identify and learn from the policy experience. If you don't have outcome indicators, you will never learn from the experience of the policy, and you'll never be able to evaluate whether it was what you were trying to do in the first place. And also, you'll never learn on any of the unintended effects, both positive and negative. And so this is very much a, a Roderick argument, and it's also very much out of, it comes out of the stiglitz Senfetusa report. In the end, policymakers have to make a choice. But you want, at least want the criteria on which you're making those policy decisions as clear as possible so everyone understands their roles. And this has been a big thing in the European case, is to make this stuff part of the conditionalities. You have to have a smart specialisation strategy. You have to develop results indicators. I call them outcome indicators. That's what Roderick says. But the reason we call them results is because many languages in Europe don't translate the word outcome. Outcome and results are the same word. And the, just a simple logic is your inputs are the financial inputs, the outputs are the measurable policy actions whose intention is to produce outcomes. And anyone, who, I mean, if you've got any background in econometrics, selection correction arguments, all the Hexman literature, that's what this is all about. Inputs are the financial resources, outputs are the measurable policy actions whose intention is to produce the outcomes. And it's that link which is what your impact is. It's not a multiplier argument way of thinking about impact. It's a policy process, and it's linking intentions to objectives. I'm going to jump on here because I'm not going to say anything else. I'm just going to mention this final point about the urban issue because this is really, really important, I think, and Andrew and I were just talking about it. There is an increasing urban agenda at the European level, and why is that? And I think it relates very much to a lot of the issues we're having here in the UK. The... Experience of the cities and city regions is very different in Central and Eastern Europe to Western Europe and Northern Europe. They're quite different, and you see it in the data, how these things are evolving. But the shift in emphasis is not because suddenly it's exciting <coughs> to talk about cities. It's one of the things that Henry Overman said yesterday. It's firstly a scale effect. If things are going well in cities, the potential positive to get that right, you get a big bang for the bunk. 
And that's a smart specialisation argument as well. It's a scale argument. But equally, many of the biggest challenges are city-related because of the size effect. You've got, if you don't sort out the big problems, the other things will never work out. It's a scale argument again. So, and across many parts of Europe, a big problem has been a governance problem, that cities don't have enough levers. In some cases, they have almost none. And so whatever they do know in terms about the local economy... Whatever they know about the local missing links, bottlenecks, whatever you want to call them, capacity constraints, they can not really do anything about them anyway because they don't have the levers or the governance autonomy to do it. And that, again, is a big experience that comes from many parts of the world, particularly the United States. And that's what the increase in urban emphasis in the European case is about. And I think that chimes with precisely the discussions that are going on here. It's about the scale of the challenges and the need to act on those without being a central government agenda all the time. But at the same time, it's not about decentralisation and localism. Because lo the danger of decentralisation and localism is you simply develop lots of local fiefdoms. And you don't want that. And that's also a problem in the European case. That's why the top-down approach is extremely important to complement a bottom-up approach, because you don't want to end up with a distributed set of monopolies. That's a worse case than a centralised monopoly. At least with a centralised monopoly, we're all in it together. Decentralised monopoly situations means you can never coordinate anything. Everything will be undermined. So, of course, it's not that. So the governance issues, in the end, are central. And the reforms to cohesion policy, if you look at the quality of governance data that they just produced, all the indicators, the Gothenburg data at the regional level, it's the first time that the quality of governance has been measured at a very, very detailed level across the European regions. And that's really the central shift. So I think some of the things here relate to some of the discussions which are taking place in the UK. Thank you very much indeed for